morning, everyone. Today's June 27th, 2024, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food Project, founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan. Every week, Jean Lawler and I are delighted to host another cutting edge webinar for mediators, arbitrators, lawyers, and everybody who negotiates. As you likely know, there's no charge for these great webinars. We ask people to contribute to a food bank if they like what they see. And since we began the series in 2020, our audiences have been so, so generous in contributing in honor of our great speakers to fight food insecurity worldwide. One of my favorite parts of the webinar every week is when we announce the running total of just how much people have contributed to food banks as a result of watching these programs. Jean Lawler, would you please do the honors? Uh, with pleasure. Um, good morning, everyone. Good evening, afternoon, wherever it is in your time zone. We are up to having served about 6 million meals. That translates to $587,918.35. So, I mean, my gosh, we're about $12,000 away from $600,000 and more than 6 million meals served around the world. Thanks so much for your generosity. That is just amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that good news, Jean. Today we have a wonderful presentation uh, by our old friend, Russ Bleemer, ADR's Hot Topics and Your Caseload. Russ is the longtime editor of Alternatives to the High Cost of Litigation, a 43-year-old monthly newsletter produced by the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution in New York, sometimes known as CPR. It's a wonderful newsletter. He reports on legal issues for and about businesses, law firms, government, and courts. He and Alternatives have received 17 national awards for writing and reporting since 2005 from ASBPE, the Specialized Information Publishers Foundation, the Society of National Association Publications, and the Apex Award for Publication Excellence. He is the editor of Mediation, Approaches and Insights, published by Juris Publishing in 2005. Because of Russ's position, he really understands the big picture of what's going on in our field better than just about anybody, and we are delighted to have him present today. Russ, please tell us a little bit about the food bank or food banks to which you would like folks to contribute if they're in a position to do so, and then your presentation. Russ Bleemer, the floor is yours. Jeff, thanks so much. I, I barely know that guy uh, that you're talking about. That was really nice of you. I, yeah, look, I don't know where to begin to say thanks for the honor of speaking in this esteemed long-running forum to an esteemed audience. Thank you all for, for coming out today and for your support of food banks nationwide. Uh, on food banks, I, Jeff had asked me some months ago, but I want to expand on my original listing. I'm in Midtown Manhattan, so it's not for the first time that's come on here, but I want to mention City Harvest in New York, which has had trucks out seven days a week for more than 40 years, bringing uh, excess food from restaurants and supermarkets to the needy. I originally signed on to this and noted Fulfill. Fulfill is the former food bank of Monmouth and Ocean Counties. It's now a network of nearly 300 organizations of all stripes and sizes. It includes food pantries that focus on distribution. Now, Bruce Springsteen highlighted the organization with his longtime support under its former name. It was and it continues to be a staple presence at his concerts in the area, as well as a presence at many other community events. Now, I spend a lot of time down in the surrounding Asbury Park, New Jersey area. The music community and citizens of those counties have embraced it and continues to do wonderful events that raise money. And it provides that startling awareness that this organization has done such a good job on. Um, in one of the nation's wealthiest counties, our neighbors often don't have enough to eat. Now, if I'm diving into New Jersey, Jeff, Gene, Natalie, if you don't mind a little diversion, if I'm going to attempt to put up some help for the hungry and I brought up Springsteen, I would really be remiss if I didn't acknowledge there's another separate and parallel New Jersey universe. And that, of course, is named Bon Jovi. 
And, you know, while Bruce and Bon Jovi have come together, multiple shows of unity for great events and fundraising, I have to note here Bon Jovi's Soul Kitchen. This is a great player in the battle against hunger, whether or not you like the Slippery When Wet album or not. Uh, John has established a nonprofit restaurant where you pay for a great meal if you can afford it. And if you can't, well, the invitation's open to everyone. And there's also opportunities not just to eat, but to volunteer and join the community in whatever capacity is possible for the individual. Right now, there's two JBJ Salt Kitchens, which is what they're called. And they've had others, I believe, pop-ups from time to time. So there's equal time in our setting for both Bruce fans and John Bon Jovi fans. And hopefully it means more for each of these institutions as well as City Harvest in New York. And we can start off moving closer to the ADR place where we can say best interests have served for all. Look, again, this is a thrill to do this. I'm swimming in the wake of such an impressive list of people I've been lucky enough to watch, to follow, and to report on, and in many cases work directly with his colleagues and his publication contributors, let alone enjoy them here on Will Work for Food. I'm gonna distill it all a little differently. I do what I do because commercial conflict resolution and legal profession is fun for me. I get to cover it. It's fascinating that it's still at least a little counterintuitive to some of legal education and practices orientations. Now, that being said, I have to stop myself quickly and acknowledge both corridors of academia and law firms, there's been ever increasing acceptance and sophistication of this profession. They not only embrace it and have declared themselves experts at delivering it, it's certainly not how I was educated and how I was practiced, but in, in how I practiced law, but that was before the first Bush administration and the Clinton administration, both of which spearheaded laws and court rules mandating ADR in federal courts. So much of this movement has flowed from the acceptance in our judicial system and so much of it has been put forth by the organization I've had the pleasure of being associated with since that time, the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution in New York, a nonprofit. It's best known, as Jeff said, the CPR Institute. What you all do is important. I believe what you all do is, is essential. So in my longtime role as the editor of Alternatives to the High Cost of Litigation, it's a monthly newsletter, by the way, I love being a fly on the wall for all of your activities. Now, when I started getting ready to speak here, I saw Ambassador Robert O'Brien. That was the most recent video that was available after Natalie and Gene and Jeff posted me as a coming attraction. He said he wasn't gonna tell you all what you don't already know. And that, that was pretty humbling. He was and remains on the front lines as he described of conflicts that have threatened all of us, let alone the immediate regions around the world he was working in, in the Trump administration. Now, as I was eagerly anticipating this get together just last week, I'm outlining the subjects I wanted to hit on, trying to make this as timely as possible. And I saw him again on Christine Amanpour's PBS show just last week, and he's getting into the details of the Middle East negotiations, past, present, potentially, depending on the election in the future. You know, that is make this pretty daunting. I immediately thought maybe I should retool this. I'm just going to make, you know, maybe the best use of your time here would be my 10 favorite will work for food events and why rather than pretend to invent new wisdom. So I'll, I'll tell you, I got a lot of stuff here. I'm not going to take uh, uh, the easy way out, but there's a theme. And, and here's where all this came from. This terrific programming has often looked at points that, that, that follow. So I'm gonna annotate with some references and maybe quote some of the leadership exhibited here on Will Work for Food, which you all, if you're new here, you can find on its website and in full form, every one of these, there's a link to YouTube and they're all there. What these events have shared is that there's a wonderful principles to operate on, to work by, to live by essential guidance and perspective for these essential important processes. So what I'm gonna do here is try to add some comments to that. Again, you know, swimming in others wake. I'm gonna share Ambassador O'Brien's humility that there's probably nothing here that you don't know, but maybe some of it has slipped your radar or if it seems like a good reminder, then after this, I'm gonna tell my old friend, Jeff, and my new friends, Natalie and Jean, this has been a massive success. So there you go. The tradition is for Jeff to introduce. He made me my own opening act. Jeff, thanks so much for those kind words. A public thank you to Jeff for his decades of support for, for my publisher, the CPR Institute, for putting many of my colleagues on Will Work for Food, and now me, all of a sudden, uh, putting them on here, and also Jeff's support for the newsletter I, I write and edit. Jeff's a contributor and an editorial board member. We don't measure that in years. We measure that in decades. Jeff, Natalie, and Gene, congratulations on the great work this program's done. The money raised, we just heard that. It's its own advertisement for your efforts, but importantly here, 
My role is to point out the body of ADR work. It's a modern reference point for people like me and hopefully people like all of us. It's going to continue to be for as long as we have YouTube around. The issues discussed have a profound impact on profound problems in ADR. And yeah, back to Ambassador O'Brien, around the whole planet. The tools, techniques, and practices are our front lines to keep peace and keep economies going and build and maintain stability. And these are the exact same ones that are used in these comparatively prosaic commercial disputes I focus on and you're about to hear uh, about more. Now I'm gonna bring it down from Ambassador O'Brien and note how we can make use of this knowledge to make commercial ADR practice more effective. You can't build your own house without the frame and the big picture of what you're building. And the world's issues seemingly subject to uh, uh, anything other than negotiation and resolution today. The answer for us is, to, you know, to do our part is really easy. We must be advocates for the process. From the micro in our mediation, our other ADR conference rooms, to my coverage in the newsletter, to the macro in our legal communities, in our general social circles. Because when correctly applied, it's a better way of addressing conflict and litigation. And certainly in the larger world, it's better than isolationism. I've been privileged to work with and on materials related to most of the designers of the modern ADR field. So excuse me for more name dropping here. Legendary mediator, Carrie Minkle Meadows. She's now a professor at the University of California, Irvine School of Law. She has said this on podiums around the world and surely behind the doors of the mediation she does. She has shared in our pages that advocacy on behalf of the profession and standing up for best practices is our duty, not only to spread it around, but to make it effective, to make it optimally effective, okay? The reason we're doing this is because we're believers. Carrie and you and I agree that we're appropriately de deployed conflict resolution is better than court fights. It's more efficient. It's usually much faster. It's less costly. That certainly is the case in the commercial area I exist in, but it's also true in those international conflicts the ambassador put on the table here. Now, you know, perspective here. I'm preaching to the choir, obviously. So, so let me note one big picture fact. Our sources in our commercial area, we're informed by literally everywhere ADR and conflict resolution practices take place. You know, my focus is big law litigators who think they've invented this stuff. They've been there. They've done that. They know what's going on. They're going to tell you how it's going to go. That's confidence, but that's not exactly the bedrock truth. For example, the commonplace issue of impasse, which you all have talked about many times here, that was on discussion in Ambassador O'Brien's session. He discussed centuries of deep-seated feelings in international negotiations in the Middle East, but he related it to comparatively common tort claims right now. And his point was he can't relitigate history, whether you're talking about Persia and the Middle East development over, over centuries, or you're talking about the history of a tort claim. Uh, you have to deal with what's in front of you now. You have to even accept impasse because sometimes the lawyer, sometimes the client, sometimes both are headed that way. We're informed by the O'Briens in the commercial area for sure, but also just as much, we're informed by the community mediators. A good commercial mediator it's going to take it from anywhere and everywhere to build consensus with an open mind to the possibilities of the case in front of her or him, not adherence to a rigid predetermined process. It's proceeding deliberately and with flexibility. So for every commercial litigator I've met over the years who described their process, and it's always insightful and informative, it's fun to hear about this stuff, but when it's supposed to be brand new, I think of the many divorce lawyers I've spoken to in another legal realm. They understand that the business law techniques came from resolution methods practiced in their area and uh, in family law for years and years and years. You know, a few years ago, Will Work for Food had my friend, former CPR Institute chairman, John Kiernan here, and he talked about something called presumptive ADR in New York courts. John is a retired partner and he's a high profile commercial litigator, big, multi-party, multi-district litigation, former litigation chair at Deborah Voice in Plimpton. But John was behind the use and an author of the use of this idea of presumptive ADR in New York state courts. He didn't want to use the words mandatory in New York, even in Europe, where mandatory mediation has had some traction in courts, particularly Italy, the designers have to hedge it. You know, a mandatory use of a voluntary agreement process, that's an opposite, you know? The idea of presumptive ADR in the Euro movement is that putting adversaries in the same room, whether they like it or not, can indeed create magic. Again, in appropriate situations, you know, civil rights needs to be litigated and all, but the worst vendor agreement dispute, you know, it really doesn't. John Kiernan spoke here on installing this trendy device all over usually diverse New York state courts from rural town courts to sophisticated commercial courts, everything under the sun and in between in the New York state unified court system. 
And John and his reporting committee didn't restrict their report backing the new presumptive ADR to John's lessons learned from class actions and motion practice and all that stuff that's just so alienating to consumers of the courts, the general public, and even some in the business world. John used matrimonial courts as the laboratory for the Bigger New York program. That's what he said here. That's where ADR was and is and best boosted by presumptive ADR. It brings the rest of the courts, AKA, what John's most concerned with it all in his area and what we look at most, the famous commercial civil part in Manhattan, it brings all the rest of the courts along with it into the presumptive ADR fold. The big push here obviously is mediation. So these commercial litigators come up with new applications and act like they invented it, but as the astute practitioners know, it's derivative. ADR practice at this stage really is never new, but it can always be refined. My friends litigating in federal court and using settlement techniques, advocating for parties' best interests, dividing pies, using sophisticated decision trees, they're doing what family and divorce mediators have been doing daily in their lives before many of us were even born. Ultimately, the clients drive this and have evolved over the years, and it has been fun being on the front lines of it. In-house people embrace early negotiation and early ADR in ways that when I got to CPR were just unimaginable. As Kiernan pointed out here on Will Work for Food, the in-house clients love to win. But they also recognize risk costs and they want to do what is in their company's economic best interest. That's a big difference from when I uh, first encountered dispute pre uh, resolution practices ages ago when in-house and outside counsel are more likely to regard such moves with suspicion. There has been a wholesale change in orientation. When I started writing about this stuff in earnest in the 90s, I was writing for a legal audience at American Lawyer Media. Our style was to define mediation and arbitration thoroughly up top. The articles uh, would, would give those definitions before diving into the details. Now, this wasn't the New York Daily News. This wasn't even the LA Times. That was for an ostensibly sophisticated legal audience who hadn't at the time had the benefit of what are now great first year law school programs that proliferate in academia and ones that, that I personally never got. We had to explain the profession and what the profession was doing to the people who were doing it. Sure, when discussing and writing about ADR now, we still need specific delineations because of the great variations that have developed in local practices and the practices that are adopted in our contracts today. But the fact that practitioners needed parameters back then was a different world. That's a lot. And it's probably obvious to many of you, but I want to point it out because I don't think a change in the culture about ADR over a generation in the legal profession and somewhat in the general public is anything to be sneezed at. And even with that, we are now challenged to keep up. Those dispute orientations, even with refined applications like the Kiernan-led New York presumptive ADR, we've moved on. We're at anticipation, You really. When we anticipate, we're considering ourselves cutting edge. ADR, some of us are calling it ADR 3.0. The buzzwords, as you know, is dispute prevention. At some level, being put in a position of resolving stuff already is a fail. Quickly here, no worries for the practitioners. You can't prevent everything. Disputes will proliferate, and this crowd will be in a position of resolving them. Your business isn't going anywhere, but maybe with yeah, maybe fewer of them with this newfangled dispute prevention orientation. Let me dive into that for a minute as a trend. I'm very proud of our publication and our organization. We discussed preventing disputes in detail 20 years ago. We had a committee at CPR that looked to spread not case management systems, but intake evaluation before they became cases to prevent them from becoming cases. That then and even now is res revolutionary stuff. Sure, the in-house counsel that I just mentioned, they're constantly uh, 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 on risk. They, they look at these prevention tactics, and I get this all the time. Like for the prototypical example would be to put some of the prevention into a deal into a deal terms. And the in-house counsel say, you know, this is really, really great stuff, really great. I just wish we could do it and it was appropriate for us. Uh, you know, five years from now, they will be doing it or sometime down the road. Uh, CPR, in fact, has a dispute prevention commitment that organizations sign, a sort of descendant from what made the organization famous back in the 90s. And you may be familiar with it. There's a corporate policy statement on alternatives to litigation and a law firm corollary. Uh, on those, companies and law firms pledge to explore negotiations first before filing suit against one another. These are non-binding commitments that are still vital. I still get calls from companies that say, is our adversary a signee of the pledge? But now we have dispute prevention, specifically a new dispute prevention pledge for business relationships. In it, a business says it's going to subscribe to a statement of policy on behalf of their company or organization. 
I, I apologize for this. I'm going to give it to you precisely because this sounds like internet ephemera and touchy feely stuff. But the the commitment itself, I'm going to read it to you in a second, has some real examples of concrete action. The commitment says to preserve relationships and business arrangements and subject to mutually agreed upon terms, we will incorporate dispute prevention mechanisms into our arrangements where appropriate. The range of mechanisms may include, for example, reliance upon resources internal to the parties, such as implementation of contractual escalation clauses to diffuse conflict within and between organizations, or third party mechanisms, such as jointly engaging in dispute prevention neutral, all designed to enable early identification of a conflict and preventing it from hardening into a, into a dispute. This statement of policy does not commit us to any particular outcome, but only to the willingness jointly to deploy dispute prevention mechanisms to help us avoid disputes and maintain our business relationships and purpose. End of commitment. The last thing I'll read to you. Uh, thanks for your patience on that. Now, with that little kumbaya ending there, this is really cool stuff that if effective, it deploys business resources more effectively, more money for R&D, more money for that new plant, the new sales office, your salary. You know, I don't do commercials, but I'm going to note that CPR Institute has been training neutrals in this area. It has a recent vintage and developing dispute prevention panel. This is ADR 3.0 for sure. It also illustrates my earlier point and this theme here. Peter Allen wrote in the 70s, the songwriter, everything old is new again. You remember that? This terrific and slick idea that CPR invented really has been around a while. It's actually been around a long while. I want to d diverge into a quick example I got, and this is perfectly timely. I got a beautiful email last week on dispute prevention. It was from a guy often regarded as the godfather in this field, James P. Groton. He's an Atlanta area retired big law lawyer. Okay, Jim got wind of the fact because he's got his pulse finger on the pulse of prevention. He got wind of the fact that in the next issue of Alternatives in Production, I'm working on our September issue, it's our back to school issue, we're going to debut a new column. It's called appropriately Back to School on Dispute Prevention. The column's going to be written by Kate Vitasek. She's a professor at the University of Kentucky. CPR actually presented Kate with its annual Dispute Prevention Award in March, the third time it was presented. The first time, two years ago, the award was presented to Jim Groton and then named after him. Another quick aside, Will Work for Food has already hosted the second winner of this topic of the three. Uh, so please go back, if you want a deep dive into, pre into prevention here, go back to the Will Work for Food archives. I'm sorry, I don't have the date here. Our good friend, Joan Stearns Johnson at the University of Florida, Florida Levin College of Law. She did a great dive into this. I'm not gonna go that deep, but back to Jim the namesake of the award. At the time Jim got that award a couple of years ago and we named it after him, he was, I believe, 95, okay? He wrote me last week with a couple of purpose, purposes, okay? And, and, and one was, I'm not gonna go into all of it, but one of them was the magnificent perspective that comes with such a grand view. He wanted to check me so that I haven't forgotten the classic work he did at CPR with many corporate and academic leaders that helped put that pledge into motion with its actual work examples. Uh, all of the predecessors to this dispute prevention pledge that I read you. Jim introduced the concept of standing neutrals and dispute boards eh, about two, 2007, 2009, spearheading a then uh, new CPR committee. He wrote about it extensively in Alternatives, which is available on Lexus and Westlaw, a little commercial. The idea is to have someone ready to tackle disputes as they arose so that joint ventures or any cooperative agreements can proceed. And that's what CPR's current dispute prevention initiatives are focusing on. That pledge I gave you, by the way, in the new panel is, is just the tip of the iceberg, a little more in a second. But Jim stressed to me in his email, the real invention came well before that. Everything old is new again. This all comes, as, as you were recognizing, I'm seeing some heads nodding here. This came from the con construction field. They've relied on these techniques forever and they've developed them continually. Jim published, I didn't need to be reminded of this, but he, he reminded me. Jim published in 1991, 33 years ago, a book at CPR called Preventing and Resolving Construction Disputes. In his email, he made the case why that construction history is important in the new column. So the Kate's column will effectively advocate the use of prevention in other areas and continue that evolution and revolution. Jim added his view of some expansion area ideas for dispute prevention, which without question you will see in coming issues. So we have nice new ways of businesses uh, and for businesses of all sizes and stripes to prevent disputes with a CPR pledge and a panel. There's a toolkit, believe it or not. 
but we're not inventing anything. This doesn't come from the divorce practice or family law, but from the dire need to keep construction projects on time and on target and to have a resolution process for disputes. No, no, wait a minute, sorry. Have a resolution process for potential disputes between general contractors and subcontractors and whomever and have that in place. That way we don't derail the construction business goal or whatever the current dispute prevention application is now that Jim wants us to expand it to. I love this historical perspective a lot because it's making today's practices better. I hope that's a takeaway here. CPR brought minds together like Groton and brought it out and forward and it had been developing and we're continuing to do that oftentimes with the honor uh, of the help and assistance of the very people who originated that or are seen as the originators. For more on the CPR history, there's a January 2021 Will Work for Food session with present and former CPR colleagues. Um, uh, early neutral uh, evaluation, Linda, you're exactly right. That's a part of the toolkit. And you know, Linda, you, you just reminded me, uh, I haven't said it yet. So all of this prevention and all of these pledges and all the ENE stuff and all that toolkit stuff on prevention, not to mention the alternatives newsletter, not to mention subscriptions. I said I wasn't going to do commercials, but I can't help it. All of this is available at www.cpradr.org. Please go there for another side to the hot topics I'm not able to cover today. There's a lot here, and I will leave time for questioning at the end. I apologize for the word salad, but there's a lot. Uh, go to CPR's website for international arbitration and mediation across borders. I'm not touching on that, but that is a hot topic. CPR's international work is voluminous. It has been for decades. You'll see my colleague Kinar Nahikian's leadership in the various initiatives, as well as the early imprints of CPR's brand new president. We have a brand new president, and hopefully she'll come on here, a little, little, little plug. Um, her name's Serena Lee. She just came to us from JAMS, and she's a former American uh, Arbitration Association uh, officer. And I did hear some microphones open up, and, and I apologize if someone was going to talk and I talked right over you. Um, I'll try and, uh, and answer the chats as I see them and as they come up, but I do have a, a lot of ground I want to cover. And I want to answer an unasked question, okay? The answer uh, is to stay as current as possible. Whatever the question you have for me is, that's, that's my answer. Stay as current as possible. It's pretty rote from a guy who puts out a newsletter every 30 days, feeds a blog when the moon is full, you know, but it's true. Arguably, the biggest change in ADR is, is that when we first started, hard focus is at CPR. We looked at legislation, new case, case decisions, initiatives, and courts. We didn't have much competition, even, even from the legal press where I came from. Now, every law firm has marketing people. They're, putting, uh, they're getting their decisions to uh, their attorneys to analyze the decisions immediately, get it out to the legal community. I love this competition. It's growing, the, it's growing the field and it's growing interest in the field and it's heightening the practice. The triple A has recently, I don't know if you heard about this, it was the end of May, but it just kind of trickled out in, 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 um, in June. They've greatly expanded, are expanding their WEG offerings. They made a big acquisition of mediate.com and arbitrate.com too. That goes alongside, they've put out for years a must-read dispute resolution journal. The AAA is long known, and you know we've worked with them uh, and, and its adversaries, I guess, as well in some parts of CPR. Information's paramount. CPR Institute and in, in Alternatives to the High Cost of Litigation immediately have, a, admittedly, we have a decidedly narrow commercial ADR interest. There's a big tent out there of stuff. But thanks to the profession, Alternatives has a different mission somewhat. We're somewhat unique, hopefully. We tell people how, what they're going to uh, have to do to change their practices. The answer is usually drafting based on the news itself. And that has manifested itself in the nation's top court in Washington. That, you know, that makes sense. Where else? So let me thank the Supreme Court this morning. They put out uh, uh, four important decisions, not the, the uh, immunity decision or the Chevron decision we were expecting. Those are on the way. But what I thought was I'm going to have to rewrite this in the hour between 10 and 11 because the court had three arbitration cases this year. They mercifully, uh, they, they must have been looking at the will work for food schedule because they issued the decisions a while ago. Three cases from this past year, uh, we covered them and uh, there was just one last year. The one from last year was actually repeated this year on a similar issue. Talk about parsing and train spotting. Two years ago, the court had six arbitration cases. So with this volume of attention on practice, maybe not your, your practice, I'll get back to mediation shortly, but ADR practice to be sure, we don't set any agendas at alternatives. The agendas have chosen us. We wanna know why these cases wind up at the court. And I think we do. 
beyond the individual circumstances of the case, the court itself has said that Chief Justice, Chief Justice John G. Roberts Jr. has written, these processes are an important part of the justice system. They need to be maintained. The maintenance on the statute itself, the 99 year old Federal Arbitration Act, it isn't comprehensive. It's been amended, but not real often. Uh, that's going to leave it to the courts for some specific issues of interpretation, and they are parsing this FAA practically down the syllables. Train spotting to those casually familiar, but with the court's intense microscope has been issues of access, arbitrability, process, and procedure that for practitioners need to be resolved yesterday. This is urgent stuff, and it's proven by the many, many interest groups that have lined up and always line up to file arbitration amicus cases at the court. Now, I could take any Supreme Court case as a brief example. So what I'm going to do is just take the most recent one and briefly note its repercussions for practitioners, mediators as well, for advocates, really for the whole nation. The case was Coinbase versus Susky. The court rejected a mandatory consumer arbitration clause by Coinbase. Coinbase is a cryptocurrency. It, it sells and provides a platform to buy and trade in cryptocurrency. The uh, case was the second time cryptocurrency had been in the nation's top court. The first time was that case from last year on arbitration. So it's kind of funny that it's come up in that context. So the, the result in Coinbase versus Susky was totally unsurprising, yet utterly shocking. And it's why we do in focusing on the current to keep your practices current. The case is part of a, a line testing the limits of mandatory arbitration. As I hope you all know in this profession and coming and joining us here today, that's been a loaded issue for years. Coinbase had a customer contract with ADR in it. If you want their Bitcoin, you want to use their platform, it goes south, you go to arbitration. And you've seen that in your cell phone agreements, your cable agreements, basically everything these days. But then it also had a sweepstakes. And the sweepstakes had rules that were contractual. And it had a forum choice clause in it. The contest had a dispute. The customers chose the venue in the court, and hence the fight. How much does the original contract rule send the case to arbitration, which is what Coinbase sought? And the decision by Justice Sonia Sotomayor was a lesson in cont contracting 101. You read one, you read the other. What rules under contract construction apply? There is a Federal Arbitration Act plain reading trend, which the court has embraced since 2019. And that's the surprising part here for many, because for so long, the court has been thoroughly deferential to the FAA. It still is. It still sends cases to arbitration. But the deference since 2019 has been to the printed word. And that first contract that Coinbase had did not send subsequent ancillary customer agreements to arbitration. So the finding of no arbitration, which has happened multiple times under the FAA itself since 2019, it's a bit of a surprise for this Supreme Court. Like the other two arbitration cases this year, and again, it's just too much to go into them all, the court was unanimous. These were three nine zero decisions, which is great. You know how split the court is. There was a 5-4 decision today on an important case. You know, it's done in arbitration. It's nine zero, done, done, and done. Move on. Everybody agrees. But there was some gloss on the last one. In the, the only one of the three cases, there was a concurrence. Justice Neil Gorsuch wrote and expanded on Justice Sotomayor's Contracting 101 analysis. And he gave an advanced ADR drafting lesson in that concurrence, suggesting you could draft away such disputes by accounting for downstream effects in the main contract. So let me publicly thank Justice Gorsuch for that because gloss like that keeps me in business. That ADR point is sure to be litigated and may someday return to a will work for food panelists who insist like I did on bringing in arbitration to the nice mediation group here. There's a lot of little things in the profession we regard as big things for our job and alerting you to practice points. One little thing, Congress, okay? Move, and this relates a little more to, to the mediation practice itself. There have been moves to restrict arbitration. They've been around since the 90s. They're non-starters. We see them. We move on. They don't attract much attention, except for when they aren't, and they pass and become law. In 2022, there was, let me give you the exact name here, there was an ending forced arbitration of sexual assault and sexual harassment act, okay, that restricted the use of arbitration in sexual assault and sexual harassment cases in the workplace. Now we're in a new election year, and we have in front of the full Senate, this has been voted and passed out of a committee, there's bipartisan support and a possible new restriction on mandatory arbitration, it's, it, is, it would be the way um, arbitration is used in age discrimination cases. It's called the Protecting Older Americans Act, okay? These are direct effects on practice, including mediation as it relates to these comprehensive ADR programs, because when the cases emerge with law changes, ADR programs must shift and change with them. It's gotta be instant. 
these often end up pushing for more mediation. Regardless, entire programs are rewritten. So these acts, cases, legislative events, they're not simply comparatively high profile ADR events. They're events that require urgent and precise practice adjustment. Our goal is, you know, set off the flares, the sirens, the sirens in the channel, the Cassandras, sound the alarms and to come up with further alternatives to the high cost of litigation, pun intended. I'm assessing these trends in three ways. There's no magic sauce here. Technology, the diversification of the profession, the aforementioned dispute prevention trends. These are the keys, in our view, to keeping up with the profession today. Again, there's nothing new under the sun here. During and after the pandemic, one of the uh, uh, inventors of modern ADR, Dean John Furyk, this is a guy, I don't know if you know the name John Furyk, on the East Coast, very well known. He's the guy whose name is on the building on my very street at the other end of town, okay? He, uh, he is, he, it, it's the Fordham University School of Law. There is the Furyk Center for Social Justice. Dean Furyk, since the 60s, has used his considerable ADR and facilitation skills to spread a gospel of social justice. A big part of his career has been about ADR as a useful tool for dealing with a whole host of society's conflicts, micro and macro, business contract disputes to the Constitution itself. Dean Ferrick wrote the 26th Amendment, okay? Uh, that is the one on, on a check on the president's office and was a big deal during part of President Trump's presidency, okay? I can't come here and pretend to address the ills of society, but I can certainly follow Dean Furyk's words, just like Ambassador O'Brien's earlier words. In our world, Dean Furyk, and we are lucky to have him, has drilled down on commercial ADR processes. He's done two alternatives articles in recent years, and I'm talking about him here because they, he's a seer. And he's come to be a theme for everything we publish in an effort to increase the effectiveness and use of mediation and arbitration. Dean Furyk's framework on those three points are all elephants in our rooms. On a good day, we're embracing them and marching to best practices. And on a bad day, ADR can look irrelevant. Very quickly, first on his list is technology. Online dispute resolution uh, in technology, ODR has been around for years. We look to UMass's at Amherst. They have the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution. It is and has to be a regular stop on our internet rounds, at least on mine to find out what's new and hot in alternative dispute resolution, not in a room, but online. Uh, online sales last year, retailing, about a third of retail, it was about $300 billion last year, and it never would have gotten there without dispute resolution. I'm asked all, uh, all the time, we just referred to the mandatory arbitration for consumers, you know, it's probably the biggest ADR issue in the public. There's plenty of misgivings about mandatory arbitration contracts. They proliferated with all sorts of businesses, but even now, with mandatory processes fully authorized by the Supreme Court for many years in employment and in consumer cases, U.S. businesses have softened. They've hedged their stances somewhat, even as they've adopted mandatory programs wholesale in your cellular contracts and cable contracts and all. And they often allow, these mandatory contracts allow opt-outs so as to be not so mandatory. And the, they allow the option of making a claim in small claims courts. They build in a lot of mediation to these processes, which is good for your business, hopefully. It's not likely ODR would have existed without mandatory processes to deal with comparatively or literal low dollar disputes online, which are a high volume caseload, to put it mildly. Mandatory resolution forums are arguably the basis for confidence in those markets. Think of eBay, a hat tip to ADR legend Colin Rule at Mediate.com, mandatory there to answer any questions if you wonder where I thought it fit in on the spectrum is absolutely appropriate. But the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution at UMass Amherst, they look at all sorts of processes, all sorts of ways you can use technology. CPR itself has offered extensive online support and seminars to conduct mediation and the electronic benefits that can be deployed. The profession, as we have reported, has accommodated and does what it likes and uses what it doesn't like. And of course, you're probably using some of it in your sessions. Document exchanges, discovery, e-discovery, all manner of ADR and litigation. Yeah, it's stating the obvious, but as John Furrick pointed out, your tech has to be to your comfort level, but also use it as an advocate for the process and embrace the evolution, the challenge practices uh, that must be addressed every single day. 
Uh, if we're going to cover this slight divergence, got to go to artificial intelligence. Uh, you're going to see an evolution right here. I'm tired of that one already. We've been questioning its utility and application to a profession where real people sit down and solve real problems. Okay. It's very easy for mediators and arbitrators to sneer at this. I'm going to evolve on this right now in front of you because you're a sophisticated bunch and you know where this is going. In fact, there's a lot of AI application to ADR. I'm trying to read everything about it and use it for our practice questions. And at times I've been spinning my wheels. I'll concede that my most effective uses of this have been to solidify my, I have already have a very strong walnut brownie recipe and it's been a big help. I used it to generate a list of top reggaeton songs since I'm really not familiar with that genre. You know, ADR, maybe not so much. Look. As a newsletter guy using ADR to generate content, that'll just get me investigated by the LA Times. They're looking into this, and that's what we used to call propaganda. Now it's misinformation, and we've seen this come up in ADI in print about everything, from the Ukraine government to the recent LA Lakers coaching candidate decision. There is no way articles are going to be written by AI and alternatives. And, you know, last week, the Supreme Court denied a case on a California issue. It, it would have, uh, if they had taken the case, it would have reheard the Viking River Supreme Court case. There was a big compromise out there for, for you California people online here. You don't need me to tell you this. So last week, the court denied the case. We were updating the PAGA situation in California for our blog. It really would have been nice to say, hey, I generate a quick summary of this long history. We'll beat the LA Times. We'll get it out faster, you know. Well, we don't really need that background. We've developed it on our own. We have it at our finger fingertips. We're, we're not going to run AI articles. That's not happening. Unfortunately, the tough critical assessment is that AI continues to improve on the extractive end. We're eventually going to have to unplug our typewriters and incorporate it. We'll never do it without disclosing it. That, that uh, I'm sure. It's not something I want to do, but saying no and never and what we're not going to do, that's instant Luddite land. In some fashion, AI is coming. It's going to make us better. I'm not clear how and when, but there's no question that it's progress, and we'll have to jump on it when it makes what we do in the newsletter better. I'm no opinions here on whether it progresses to destroying humanity. I, I um. I got blindsided by this. I teach a class v very quickly. I was grading some papers. I hadn't done it in six months. In January, I was grading some papers, and it was 155 or so essays. The first four of them, I, you know, first five or six, the light bulb didn't go off. When I got to about number 20 of 155, I realized, boy, these things really do look too similar. So thank you, ChatGPT. I was able to figure out what these students were doing. It's been way harder in ADR, but CPR, keeping this timely, just last week brought in Susan Guthrie. She's the incoming chair of American Bar Association section of dispute resolution. She lit the usually dull light bulb I have on about how to deploy AI and why it's not something to be sneered at in our area. Yeah, we have had articles and alternatives on it. Ethics questions abound. They always do with any technique to be deployed in an ADR setting. To be clear, the starting point and the paramount concern is ethics when a tool is deemed useful for deployment. But Susan demonstrated to my wonder the utility of ADR for mediation, and it's amazing. I'm going to refer you to the session. She, Susan uh, put a page up for the CPR uh, event she did, and, and uh, she put a, it on her site, and you could see it there. Uh, I mean, it was really good. And I also, by the way, I want to refer you. Susan, uh, in May 2021, she destroyed a Will Work for Food session. It was great. Uh, it was a great session. She's done two of them here, but, but that was then. And this is AI news, which is happening front page of the Times this morning every single day. I can't summarize the whole pay, uh, program Susan did, but she did an amazing thing. She entered a typical mediation scenario on dividing assets for a divorce, and she used it to generate options. It's kind of reminiscent of a decision tree. The scenario was a moment to type in and generated instantly a table of paths. It was jaw dropping for me. Susan suggested this can be effective for practice to anonymize the mediation ADR setting and to run scenarios on AI to map out how it may go. And of course, it goes way beyond that. There's a whole AI dive into emotional support tools that can help assimilate your techniques. Uh, you know, based on participants' language, that can actually be inputted to help achieve goals where there are emotional backdrops. It can help recognize wellness needs and issues based on language, provide coaching for parties who might request it, all the while strictly observing, this is very important, your Americans with Disabilities Act legal obligations, as well as your mediator and lawyer ethical codes. 
We are going to be back here, and I am not going to miss this one. Thursday, July 18th, Joanna Matos, Matos, I don't know how to pronounce her name. I think I got it right. <laughs> one of those attempts. She's going to be here and going to discuss the negotiation of applications of AI, and there'll be more on optimizing your strategies through AI, which is what Susan just did for us. August 29, Graham Ross is going to be here with AI mediation role plays. This is another can't miss. So see there, you know, I went from uh, being inundated by this and, and being rolling my eyes, wanting new and different takes to put it to use. Um, so I, I'm really glad to see all this. That was point one of Dean Ferrick. I got to move along. Point two of Dean Ferrick's was diversity. And sure, there's been blowback in the wake of students for fair admissions versus Harvard from the Supreme Court. Huge strides in the diversity of the profession have been made by JAMS, by the AAA by CPR Dispute Resolution Services, LLP, CPR Institute's uh, provider arm. They've, they've made huge strides in changing the way neutrals are selected, uh, and that's helped build the profession, and it's increased the perception that ADR is indeed a parallel system of justice to the courts, as Chief Justice Roberts noted. It increases the, the reality that ADR is and can be fair. Uh, the ways affirmative action uh, are addressed, though, have to be changed. But ADR, the market has spoken, and groups like the Ray Corollary Initiative, that's Ray Corollary.org, they're not retreating, and indeed, they're increasing their efforts. RCI aims to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in the selection of arbitrators and mediators and other ADR neutrals. CPR helped develop it and sign on to RCI's commitment. JAMS and AAA were on board immediately. It's needed because the users of ADR have diversified. The market has demanded it. The presumptive ADR in New York that I discussed earlier has increased access to a wide variety of neutrals, which it is deemed are necessary for a wide variety of programs. Now, the predominantly business-focused CPR and AAA and JAMS, they're, they're right there in diversifying panels and boosting minority panel selection because the businesses themselves want it. It's the fact that diverse workforces are better in terms of everything, efficiency, opening markets, contented workforce, everything operational. That's a real stained glass loyally way of saying the users want it. Commercial parties want diversity because it makes their business better, and that includes in the mediation room. So this profession deserves a big pat on the back for its efforts, but like the rest of our society, we have a long way to go on that. Dean Ferrix, number three. I've got to go back to conflict prevention, but in a different guise. Uh, John Ferrick in our pages discussed the Divided Community Projects Bridge Initiative. This is at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law in Columbus, Ohio. It's working on using alternative dispute resolution systems to develop processes that keep initial protests safe, but also work to offer a path toward engaging the entire community in more systematic reform for whatever the problem is. It provides people like you facilitators, mediators, other individuals with problem-solving experiences, they get, uh, uh, those people have uh, the background and present the opportunities to resolve, mitigate, or temper situations of civil unrest. So what do we care about this? With, with our business orientation? Well, it's manifest and the importance for our society and democracy to be able to address and hopefully find common ground that eventually will help resolve or, or, or alleviate these problems. But as noted minutes ago, many minutes ago now, and, and I'm, I'm getting there, uh, this is how we resolve those business and commercial disputes. It's going to come from the techniques that emerge in these existential community and interpersonal dispute resolution efforts. These community prevention and resolution efforts are taking the skills that you're using day to day. They're making it ADR squared. They're upping the ante and applying those skills to better society by preventing conflicts. That's why Dean Fierick highlighted it in our pages. And also then subsequently CPR recognized it and presented it with its annual awards. And that's plural. One went to the program and one went to an article about the actual plan. This is the height of touchy feely ADR for in-house counsel. They have different priorities, but at the same time, it's progress and progression toward the highest and best use about what you do and the way you do it. I'm going to sum up on John. He said he writes, uh, while the foundation of ADR must remain intact, Dean Ferrick says, of course, and we know this, the field needs to be dynamic and adapt to our changing times. I can't do better than him. So four recommendations. One, in addition to embracing your cover level, comfort level with technology, John was also obsessed with looking at, DA, D, uh, at, at artificial intelligence. And the profession needs to 
uh, take precautions and regulations to in, in, instill our AI and the legal profession, but make sure to prevent the errors, the privacy inv invasions, and paramount those ethical violations. Number two from Dean Fierick. Firms and organizations should consider data to determine if their diversity and inclusion practices have been effective, things like the Ray Corollary Pledge. And if they haven't been effective, they need to expand their diversity practices. Three, ADR professionals should consider introducing conflict prevention tools and practices to communities that battle with racism, poverty, homophobia, issues of civil unrest. We can mend small rifts before detrimental eruptions occur and learn from that by using things like the Moritz Law Divided Community Project that might already exist or can be developed. And uh, number four, final from him, the successful ADR professionals should consider taking on pro bono ADR matters for low income clients who do not have the means to use the courts. The subject of volunteering your services to get a foothold in the profession has been questioned in the past by our co-host Jeff Kitchhaven in our very newsletter. That point isn't as easy as it seems for you all to do. But Dean Fierick did note, and quote, I apologize for reading to you again, he said, ADR professionals should also continue to reach out to poor communities about court and next mediation and arbitration options. There are paths to do that that are incontrovertible and uncontroversial, okay? I've gone on a while, and if I were astute, I would shut up and end with the wise words of a literal statement like Dean Fierick. But I'm not going to do that. I have just a little bit more for you. I want to highlight something that's essential to your practice that has been personally important to me. I focused on this professionally, intermittently over the years, long before I ever went to law school. It recurs in conflict resolution continually. And I'm going to leave it as a takeaway and possibly a warning and possibly a gratuitous warning. And you'll tell me if it is for the profession in practice. Listen, it's about listening. It's the most important, you know, it's the most important skill in every business book I've ever read. You know, going back to the 80s, remember Tom Peters in Search of Excellence, remember Mark McCormick, what they didn't teach you in Harvard, Harvard Business School uh, in the 90s, you know, the more recent Bible, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Listening is at the heart of all of them. Hell, The Art of the Deal by Donald Trump, believe it or not, if you didn't read it, it spent a big chunk on how listening to people is the key to the title, The Art of the Deal. I have had the fundamentals of listening hard. You know what the cliche is, it's active listening. I've had that up in my work since I graduated college and nowhere is it more important than ADR and mediation. I was honored to write a piece on the importance of mediator listening for, for another one of our seers, Missouri Law Emeritus Professor John Landy did a theory of change online symposium five years ago and it's out there. If you need a link, and by the way, if you have any questions about any of this, or if you wanna threaten me after this, I wouldn't blame you. Alternatives at CPRADR.org is the email, alternatives at CPRADR.org. I'm finishing in a moment, okay? Natalie and Jeff and Jean are gonna ask me something probably detailed as they've done to past speakers, and hopefully it'll spark some insight into something here. But you know what I may do? I may answer a different question about ADR, or maybe I am gonna talk about Bon Jovi. And if I do that, I'll be doing what you see every Sunday on Face the Nation or this week, or what you saw on, on the, the, the cable channels last night. I'm probably just gonna believe that I managed to make this talk without anything obviously offensive or much worse. But this is a convention now. You answer what you wanna get across, not what you were asked and not what you've heard. I simply refuse to see a line between deliberate dissembling, which you know is sometimes considered good avoidance politics. You're gonna see it tonight when you watch, I, there's a debate on tonight or something like that. If you, you put this thing on, you're gonna, you're gonna see a little this de deliberate disassembling. I, I refuse to see a line between that and investing yourself with hard listening practices. You don't need me to tell you, and I'm not gonna do it, how bad, bad listening skills are for ADR. Bad, 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 okay? But what I do wanna tell you here and leave you with this is I get a fair amount of people who want me to write about their ADR problems, and it's usually unmistakable. The case of the conference or the ADR provider, whatever, didn't do what they expected or wanted or needed or thought was required, and they lost, and they're unhappy. Sour grapes, it's not a big deal. Sour grapes are natural. It may be healthy. But this is not that in terms of complaints. The institutionalization in the courts and in commercial contracts that I spoke about up top has made mediation an expected step and an expected process, and it's made sophisticated users. There are expectations among neutrals and advocates as how it will go, and it's the same with parties. Something beyond sour grapes has been happening in recent years, something about individual provider conduct. 
I'm specifically talking here about high value cases, bringing in well-known mediators to get the parties over a hump. You know, those top mediators, bigger and bigger cases, bigger and bigger fees. And in these high state cases, the mediators sometimes show up appearing to expect their presence to bring the parties to a quick and rapid conclusion. That, that's what the parties are saying. When that doesn't happen, the cases have been descending quickly to talks about the mediator's calendar and the need to an expedited resolution because that big name announces often very early in those proceedings, he or she isn't going to be available. And of course, there's an easy answer to this. And at the risk of flat out obsequiousness, our co-host Jeff Kitchhaven in the past has had his calendar right out on the internet. That was a lovely idea. And his transparency continues in a different form and it's admirable, okay? But is the power of top mediators really not about their ability to listen to the problem, instead rests on their presence? Well, I hope not. When parties on both sides want to examine the case, they're reporting on caucuses that are slight on facts and much deeper on flight and train schedules. Unfortunately, there's more than enough to qualify as a trendlet, if not a boomlet. No, I'm not going to name names, but the bully pulpit occupied by a charismatic mediator can and does resolve cases. But that's usually not why the parties are there. Sometimes, but not usually. When the white hair and the nice suit and the vast experience doesn't settle, it's time to delve into the cases. Parties say that when stakes are high, their cases aren't being reviewed adequately in advance. Whatever preconceived notions that were planted have become bedrock and the biggie, once a session has started, is they aren't being heard. Parties are hearing mediators assure them that they understand what's going on and say, why hasn't it settled? What is it gonna take to end this? Rather than getting into the details, the travel schedule is on the table right next to the party's offers. When it works, it's genius. When it doesn't, it can be a travesty of ADR and what ADR is supposed to be about. Now, clearly, not every bargaining table is transformative, but mediators are not the judge of whether they're listening well when they're selecting what they want to hear. The people in front of them are. So if you want to you know, write off the occasional client naivete about what they were getting into, feel free. But this is more than that. And it's not me telling you what, to, what you need to do either. It's the client's. Whatever is needed to make that client feel that its case is understood as the guide because it leads to sophisticated clients progressing on a road to resolution. Anything short of that is uh, being cut off from the process. Read the room and listen and mediation clients will respond. And if they don't, well, at least they'll walk out and they'll feel they have a shot. The idea certainly goes along the spectrum of any types of cases, but I do wanna clarify the phenomenon is coming to me in big cases and that well-known mediator is being said to have wasted time and not brought the effort to a new one. I'm done with these words, the same words I started with. Noted ethicist and professor Carrie Minkle Metal has the answer, and that's being an advocate for the process in both words and techniques. And the techniques begin with listening hard. I'm sorry, I did go over. I didn't think I would. Thanks for the opportunity. You all are patient, patient people. Russ, thank you so much. You covered so much territory and so, with so much expertise and so articulately in the time there not only is there no time left for questions there are no questions to ask you you covered everything beautifully the food banks both the the springsteen food bank the bon jovi food bank and the uh new york city the manhattan food bank to which uh, russ referred russ these were 60 incredibly valuable minutes for everybody here thank you so much my friend with that, we are complete.